Well, good morning again. Wait a minute, all those kids are gone, it looks thin. We are in Romans chapter 3 this morning. I was asked if uh, I was going to do a Mother's Day message today, and uh, I, my response was, I did one one time, and it was so bad, I swore I would never do a Mother's Day message again. <laughs> and ever since then, whatever series I've been preaching or going through, uh, I've just continued on. And I was talking to Diane about this uh, this week, and she said, well, it's because this is where God wants you today. And I have to agree with her. Romans 3.23 is um, well known. We are on a series of doctrine. We started a few weeks ago on talking about the Word of God and that it is our authority and it is authentic, it is inspired, and it is without error. And then we talked about God and we, we had uh, the idea that came that God is God and I am not. I ask you to remember that. And then last week we talked about our enemy is Satan. And so in a, in a way that I think is a normal progression today, we're going to talk about our problem and that's sin. We have a sin problem. The passage in front of us, Romans chapter 3, verse 23, as I said, most of you probably know it, says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned. We could go back a few verses to verse 10 in that chapter and read these words, There is no one righteous, not even one. We can go over to chapter 6 and verse 23 that tells us that the wages of sin is death and letting us know the ultimate outcome of our sin. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 tells us that we are literally dead in our transgressions and sin. These are just a few places out of the Word of God that talk to us about the fact that you and I have a problem and it's called sin. The Bible also lets us know that not only do we have a problem called sin, within ourselves we have no ability to do anything about it. That's a sad, sad fact. The prophet Isaiah spoke these words, chapter 64, verses 6 and 7. It says, all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind our sins sweep us away. No one calls your name or strives to lay hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and make us waste away because of our sins. The Lord there was talking to Israel and letting them know that because of their sins, they were suffering. Back to the book of Romans, if we went back to chapter 1, verse 28, in, in that text, I'm not going to read it, but he lets us know that because of our sin, because of the rebellion within mankind, people were given over to suffer the consequence of their sins. Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, wrote these words, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14. It says, Man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. All of those that we've read and talked about here, and the text we've read, and scriptures we've looked at, let us know... Humanity has a sin problem. We can't do anything about it. This morning, I want to look at that a little bit. This morning, I want to look at how it happened that we have a sin problem. And I want to look at the fact that there is a remedy for our sin problem. 
So first, let's just look at how sin entered this world. Where did sin come from? Well, we go all the way back to the first of Genesis. The first three chapters of Genesis laid out before us the doctrine of sin. And it talks about the fall of Adam and Eve. And in those first three chapters, we have the framework given for us that every individual has a responsibility and an accountability to God for who we are and how we live. Those of us who know a story know that Adam was created in God's image. In fact, every human being has been created in God's image. Never ever forget that. That every human being has been created in the image of God. And when he's talking about being in the image of God, it's talking about the fact that we are moral beings who have a choice on how we will live. If you noticed, if you noticed the story of, of Adam and Eve, and when after God created Adam, he, he gave him some specific instructions, some things to do. He told him that he was to have dominion over all things that were created. He placed Adam in a garden and said, Adam, you are to tend this garden. Uh, I, again, we have those beautiful plants, and ladies, you're going to have something to take home with you, a, a beautiful plant of, of some sort. Uh, yesterday, Diane and I walked around our yard after we ran some errands and just looked at the beauty of God's creation. The flowers that are coming up and the trees and, and their shapes. And Brother uh, Joe Pratt said to me this morning as he walked in the door, he said uh, something I mentioned about it's a beautiful day. He says, and somebody can deny that there's a God with all this beautiful, beautiful world that we look at. Uh, we, we, Adam was told to tend the garden. And it wasn't a labor, it was to keep him interested, to keep him occupied. But after sin came, it became a burden. The one thing that God told Adam he could not do was to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He told him that. God's word was so clear to Adam and promised to Adam that the day you eat of that tree, if you disobey me and you eat of that tree, you will bring death into this world. You will die. And of course, Adam didn't die immediately physically. He did uh, eventually. But spiritually, Adam died that day. He was separated from God. And you know the story that after Adam and Eve sinned, God came to commune with them as he had in the cool of the day. Adam and Eve hid because they didn't want to see God. They didn't want to face God. Adam and Eve had a choice. And they chose to sin. And because of that, sin became a problem on all their descendants. And that's you and me. Before that, they lived in perfect harmony with God. They lived in, in a wonderful, wonderful world. And, and sin ruined everything. All because Adam sinned. Because of that, you and I have inherited, I'm going to use the word, a corrupt nature. We, everyone who has been born has been born literally condemned because they have inherited a sin nature. Paul makes it very clear, again, in the book of Romans, chapter 5. Let me turn to that here. Chapter 5, starting with verse 18. He says, Just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man the many will be made righteous. Here he explains very clearly that because of Adam's sin, every one who is his descendant is born with a sin nature. We are all born condemned. That means everyone you know. It's so good to see so many families here and people visiting their, their mothers and families on this wonderful day and we're glad you're here. But everywhere around and you look in this room, you see people who started out condemned. I don't mean to bring it downer because we're going to end this on a high note today. But, but that is the position of everybody. 
Every individual you know stands condemned. Every loved one, every family member. Because that sin, that corruption has been passed on. Uh, there, there's a word that is used to talk about that. It's called depravity. Total depravity is used often. I don't use that word too much because it is misused and misunderstood. But it is a good word and I do want to talk about it. It's been misused in the sense that some people think that it means you're as bad as you possibly can be. Well, you know that that's not true, don't you? You have neighbors that are good neighbors that you know don't know the Lord. Is that correct? Say, so, so shake your head yes at least, at least I know. We all do. In fact, you might have a family member that you know that, that their destiny is not heaven if they were to die today. But you know that they're good people. They do good things for you. Uh, it, it's just the, the fact of life. Because non-Christians do do very good things. They can, can live very good lives. Jesus gives a wonderful illustration out of Matthew chapter 7. He says, which of you, if his son asks for a piece of bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good things to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father in heaven give you good gifts to those who ask him? He's saying there, we have a humanity as a whole are good people. Over and over again I hear people, especially if you go to a, a funeral, well he was a good man, she was a good woman, and I understand what they mean. But my question is, did they know the Lord? As a pastor that's my question I always ask. But we live in a world of good people. And I've said this before and i say it again. As far as I'm concerned, one of the greatest tragedies of hell is going to be full of good people. Hell isn't specifically the place for the Adolf Hitlers and Mao Zedongs, the mass murderers. Hell is where good people go who never respond to the gospel. And quite honestly, one of the reasons we need to be people preaching and teaching the word and living faithfully in front of other people the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ is that we are the witness that Lord has put into this world to tell people how they can get to heaven and miss hell. But the problem is, all people are totally depraved. Not in the sense that they're as bad as they can be, but this way. They're as bad off as they can be. The Bible is clear that there's really no difference in the degrees of sins. We talk about big sins and little sins. In fact, well, let me illustrate it. We talked about this in my Sunday school class last week out of Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21. Let me read these and listen for a moment. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft. And that comes from the root word where we get drugs. So we could say drug addiction, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgy, and, and the like. And Paul says, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now in that group, if you notice, as we went through it, are what we would call some of the big sins, and some that are not. You, you, you get drunk down at the bar and you stagger back to your car or, or home or, or it's obvious to people you've had too much to drink. Uh, you, you, but those selfish ambitions, let me ask you a question. Are you selfish? Don't, don't answer it. By nature we're all selfish, are we not? You can say yes to that. You see, some sins are out there in front of God and everybody, as they say, and some sins are kind of hidden here, are they not? There are some sins that only God and you know. Maybe not even your husband or wife, or your mom or dad or child. I want to go one step further with this. On the Sermon on the Mount, did not Jesus say, Matthew chapter 5, verse 22, that if you are angry or you have hatred in your heart 
for someone else, you're as guilty as if you murdered him? Is that not true? You know that? Did he not say in verse 28 that if a man lusts after a woman, he's already committed adultery with her in his heart? And we can reverse that like Lisa did with the kids here. A woman lusts after a man. See, he's talking about a condition of the heart. That sin nature is, is our heart. It's, it's who we are inside. And so, yes, in, in our economy, the actual act is worse than thinking it. But it is still caused by the sin problem, a sinful nature in each of us. The problem is, we're as bad off as we can be. Understand this. We don't become a sinner because we commit acts of sin. We commit acts of sin because we are a sinner in our heart. Now that leads me to ask a question. What is sin? Well, I, lit, I read a list of things over here a moment ago that uh, are pretty obvious, but, but, but let's get closer to home. What, what is sin? First of all, I want to say all sin is against God. God's the one who defines sin for us, even the sinful acts that we've talked about here. But what sin is, is anything that goes against God's perfect nature. When David confessed his sin, Psalm 51, he didn't say, Lord, I'm guilty of adultery with Bathsheba. He didn't say, Lord, I'm guilty of murder of Uriah, her husband. He said in verse 4, against you and only you have I sinned. David there grasped the truth that although he had committed a very serious sins in his life, ultimately his sin was against God because God is the one who set the standard. And you and I need to understand that sin is first of all against God. You and I need to start thinking that way. Paul Little gives this illustration, and let me read it to you. I think it's most interesting. He says, we need to look at sin from God's eyes. He says, suppose you and I were to compare one's morals as being Death Valley at 280 feet below sea level. Another person's morals as being Denver, the mile-high city. And another person's morals as the peak of Mount Everest, which is 29,000 feet high. The person in Death Valley represents the ruthless low life in society. The person in Denver is the average man, that's you and me. And the one on Mount Everest would be the best person we could imagine, a Billy Graham or a Mother Teresa. The, the enormous difference in altitude or elevation are apparent. By comparison, God's standard is holiness, perfection, 100%. And that's represented by the distance from the earth to the moon. Morally and without help, we are as far from God's holiness. He says, now since we can see things from the moon, we have the opportunity to notice that Mount Everest and Denver and Death Valley all look the same from the moon. From a human standpoint, there's a great difference in men's sinfulness. But contrasting that with the infinite holiness of God, the moon, all men are equally lost and extrained from their Creator. Bottom line, there's no big sins, no big sins. There's just sins. You and I are sinners, have a sin nature because of Adam. And that sin nature condemns us. If Adam had never sinned, we would not be condemned and we would not need a Savior. But he fell, he sinned, and we need a Savior. The Bible talks, uses different terminologies to talk about sin. Uh, the most common use is one that you and I know all too well, and it's just spelled out as sin. I forgot to bring my light, so you'll have to forgive me, but Diane suggested I put a light behind us. I, I love shooting. I like target practice. And earlier this week, I got out my bow. I hadn't used it in months. And I set it up in the backyard, 
and perfection in hunting or target practice is this little orange shot. Can you see that in the back at all? Yeah. I know, okay. That's perfection. I took eight shots. There's one right here. Got really close. I got one up here, here, and here. One over here. A little missed a little bit. One over here. One down here. And this one I missed God and everything. None of them perfect. The best definition for sin is missing the mark. As close as this was, I missed. As close as... And every one of us in this room is guilty of this kind of sin. Because this week, not one of us, no matter who we would like to think we are or where we've been, all of us have missed the mark. We've fallen short. But that's because of our sin nature. We cannot live up to God's perfect standard. There's another word that's used in scriptures that I'd like to mention, and that's transgressions. I read it in one of the passages of scripture earlier. Transgression basically means a stage of rebellion. This is more than just our humanness missing perfection. This is when we say, God, I will not. This is when we say, God, I don't care what you say, I'm going to. Then there's another term used in Scripture called iniquity. This is referring to a moral or an immoral act. This is where there's no moral or spiritual values in a person's life, where there's a lawlessness. This is actually giving oneself over to where, in a sense, sin becomes their God because that's how they wish to live. It doesn't matter what category our sin falls into. We're sinful because we have a sin nature. And there's nothing you and I can do about that sin nature. Oh, we can compare ourselves with our neighbors. Do you, I don't want to ask you if you do that. I know we do that. I'm better than she is or he is. We look at them. We've all done it. Uh, and we do it to say, uh, look how, you know, I, I, I don't have this sinful problem they do. They drink too much alcohol. They're, they're down at the bars at night. They're out chasing women. They're out doing drugs. We, we can look at things and make ourselves feel better. I don't gossip like he does. On and on we can go and make ourselves look better compared to another person but the bottom line is when we use God's standard which is perfection I don't like what I see. We can't deal with the sin on our own. But what is the remedy? What is the answer? How, how, do, uh, how does an individual deal with sin? Well, I've, I've really danced all around it this morning as we've talked about different issues and things because as, as we stated that you and I can do nothing about it. We can somewhat control ourselves so we don't look as bad as we really are in the eyes of the world. And we can look good on the outside, but our sin nature still uh, is there. It's inbred in us because of Adam. And because of that we stand condemned and we're as bad off as we can be. But God gives us the answer. God answers the problem for us and the answer is Jesus Christ. It's not the church. I'm a Baptist by choice and I love Cornerstone Baptist Church and I'm so thankful I'm here. But the answer is not being a Baptist. It's not that you are religious. Uh, the answer is found in Jesus Christ because we as humans have that sin nature. We have a heart that is hard. We have a heart that needs to be made new. We need a spiritual birth as the Bible talks about. We need to have our mind renewed. Remember again, I read Romans a few moments ago, Romans chapter 5, uh, verses 18 and 19. It says, by one man we all stood condemned, but by another there is hope for the many. When Jesus came into this world, he died for us, and he is willing and wanting to give us his righteousness in exchange for our sin. David's prayer over in Psalm 51 was, Lord, create in me a clean heart, a pure heart. And that needs to be 
our prayer as an individual. Lord, create me a, a new heart so that my heart is in tune with you. A heart that wants purity and holiness and morality. Lord, I need a new heart because my heart is so full of sin. Create in me a new heart. And Jesus told Nicodemus over in John chapter 3, you must be born again. There has to be a spiritual birth. I trust most everyone in this room has had a spiritual birth where you know that you've understood that you are a sinner and that you are condemned and that there was a time in your life when you asked the Lord to forgive you of that sin, to come into your life to be your Lord and Savior. But my, with a group this size today, I'm not confident of that. I don't know all of you. There's some people here I've met for the first time. I don't know where you stand. Have you been born again? Have you been at that time when you acknowledged you were a sinner and you needed Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sin? Paul, again, in the book of Romans chapter 12, tells us that we need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Over and over again, we come to the answer. We need to have our thinking changed. We, we made a, uh, in, the, in the baby dedication this morning, we made the comment that we need to have a Christian worldview. We need to think like Christians. We need to teach our children to think like Christians. Every one of us in this room needs to think like a Christian and, and not be persuaded by the, the climate of our culture or the political culture, but stand upon the Word of God. We have to, in faith, trust Jesus Christ as our Savior. And when that happens, a life is radically changed. He is the only hope. No matter where we find an individual, Remember John the Baptist when he saw Jesus coming. He said, the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verses 14 and 15, talking about Jesus Christ. How much more then will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanses our conscience from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God. For this reason Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. What he is saying there is nicely as I know how to put it. Jesus, when he came into this world, he paid for our sin. And he cleanses us with his blood. I love that old hymn. What can take away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Jesus came into this world, shed his blood, so that you and I and any individual who will turn to him can go to heaven when they die. Look, folks, we live forever. Every individual who has been created, every one of us in this room today, will live forever. We will either be there in heaven or we will be in hell. And when, quite honestly, when we realize the severity of hell, it's a sobering truth that I need to get right with the Lord Jesus Christ. I love what Jesus said as he dealt with Nicodemus. Later on in John, we all know John 3.16, but starting with verse 17, it says this, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. God's the one who's provided salvation. God's the one who will transform us from the inside out. We just have to choose to let Him do that. We have to let Christ be our Lord and Savior. We have to trust Him with our life. We have to be asked to have spiritual life to be brought back into our lives. Every one of us in this room has been born a sinner. And there's nothing we can do to change that. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. You all know that scripture, but let me read it. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. 
And this is not of yourselves. It is a gift from God, not of works, so that no one can boast. We can't do it. Salvation is what God offers to us through Jesus Christ. The only hope any individual has is Jesus. The only hope that you have is Jesus. The only hope that I have is Jesus. The only hope that your family has, that your neighbors have, your co-workers have, is Jesus. He is the one that can transform a life. He went to the cross. He died there, shed his blood. He paid the price for my sins so that I could have eternal life. He died there, shed his blood for you as well. So that you can know that heaven's your home when you leave this world. Do you know him today? Have you trusted him as your savior? The Bible tells us there's salvation and no one else. There's no other way. No other way. Only Jesus. Have you trusted him? We're going to give a hymn of invitation, have a hymn of invitation right now. And the invitation this morning is this. First of all, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you need to come speak to me and say, Daryl, I need Christ as my Savior. And I'll be delighted to pray with you. You might be under the conviction that the Lord needs you, wants you to, to join this church uh, th this morning. Come and, and let that be known. You might just need to come and pray and ask God to forgive you uh, as, of something that's going on in your life or to encourage you and have a brother or sister come pray with you. The altar is always open for that. Whatever the Lord is speaking to you to do this morning, say yes to what the Spirit of God is saying to you. Shall we stand? We're going to sing.